headphones, the microphones. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Good night, everyone. I was just talking and talking, like giving my speech. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Juan Diego. I work for Escuela Caracol. I work with the communications and with the, um, the marketing for the school. And I'm also someone like that, like you, like most of you, love Escuela, Escuela Caracol with my whole heart. Tonight, I'm here with some real good friends of Escuela Caracol with Glenn Pierce. Can you say hello, Glenn? Hello. Lisa and Grace. Lisa, your microphone is off. Lisa, can you please turn it on? <coughs> Lisa, you, your microphone is not working. Oh, Karina. Hola. Hello. Hola. Lisa, can, can you listen to us? Your microphone is off. Lisa, okay, so there should be a mute button at the bottom, Lisa. Oh, maybe they're frozen. frozen. Ah, they're frozen. Well, I know they're not, <laughs> they were just <laughs> acting as statues. Uh -huh. Okay, and we are also with Josue and Corina, Joshua and Courtney Wilson. They Hi. are thanks to them, is that we are here today because mm -hmm. they were the the founders of escuela caracol they they were the the, the first one thinking about this mm -hmm. idea that became this amazing amazing well living living being that has become escuela caracol so hello joshua hello karina hola josue i'm so glad to have you here tonight okay and we are also with lisa and grace Gracie. Lisa is another really good friend of our school. She spent she spent how, how long how long were you in Escuela Caracol? Two years, right? Oh, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah, two years. Grace just appeared. Yeah. Hola Grace. And Grace was a student oh, in Grace. Escuela Caracol. She's currently in sixth grade, right? Mm -hmm. Or did you finish sixth? Well, they are frozen. Uh, we are gonna do something with you, Grace and Lisa. Uh, we are gonna uh, turn your camera off and we are gonna stay with your microphone only, okay? Maybe that's gonna that's gonna work better for for some. Mm -hmm. Ah no, I can't do it. I'm sorry. You, you're the only one who can do that. Hola, and who's that little girl with hey, Joshua and Karina? Mirabai. Mirabai? Hola, Karen. She's huge. She's huge. I met Mirabai when she was maybe two and a half or three years old. Yeah. I think. Little baby. Okay, oh, so hey, Joshua. Althea wanted to be here tonight, but she's working. She's working. Okay, she graduated from from she school. Just graduated, year, right? yeah. yeah, she's about to begin the, the magical trip of college. And <laughs> nice. And who's that little guy? That's Sandino. <laughs> right? Ideal. Another huge kid. Yeah. Hola Sandino. Okay, so uh, Joshua Courtney. Could you please begin by, by telling us a little bit about how did this all begun? Like how, why, or how did this happen? It was her idea. <laughs> um, well, Joshua and I, thanks. <laughs> We left the United States in a van with Althea, our oldest. She was three, four at the time. And um, we decided that we just wanted to live. I had been studying in Mexico and we had friends in Belize. And so we decided that we just wanted to see what life was like south of the border. Uh, we wanted to be in a culture living closer to the land and living more in community. 
and by a series of crazy events, a broken down van and other kinds of things, we ended up in Guatemala City and we could not get our Volkswagen van with the Subaru engine fixed because the Volkswagen people turned it down and the Subaru people turned it down. So our friends said we should probably just go to the lake. <laughs> and uh, prior to that, we had had a conversation when everything went wrong for us in Belize. We just decided to name our ideal living situation. And so uh, we were sitting down in a Chinese restaurant and we all just started naming things that we wanted for our life. So we said that, I said that I wanted to be uh, in the mountains. Josh wanted to be near water. Um, we wanted to be able to speak Spanish. We didn't want to have a car. Uh, I wanted to live in an, with indigenous, in an indigenous village because I had done, um, I had spent some time in Mexico and indigenous communities and was just really drawn to the sense of community there. So, uh, and then I said that I also wanted to be able to continue my yoga practice. <laughs> so San Marcos de la Laguna was the perfect spot so for we, you. When it we was got perfect. Off the boat, we ended up in La Paz, yeah. a little hotel there, and Ben Hamid was was very kind to us. The first morning, I took a yoga class, and um, I met someone who was volunteering there at the Cambalacha. So I met Charlie and Gabby at the Cambalacha right away, and. Um, one thing led to another and we just, we even got a free place to stay in San Marcos and we just decided that we wanted to live there and raise Althea there and connect with local people. So that's kind of how we got started. So it's like, the, this is something I've always said. Escuela Caracol is like a magical spot, like, an energetic spot in the world that gathers people, that gathers intentions. And Glenn, can you please tell us about the first time you went to Escuela Caracol or, or to the first time you came to, to visit us? So um, when the Spanish teacher at the Waldorf School here in North Carolina uh, was started planning the trip, she asked for volunteers to help chaperone the high school students. And so I said, well, why not? Uh, you do all the talking and I'll do whatever you say. Uh, and uh, it was it was funny how much of my Spanish from 20 years earlier, uh, just taking it in high school, was able to come back. I was actually able to have conversations by the second day of being in Guatemala. And uh, we had gone up to the to the school to meet with the teachers and and make the plans for the week. We were going to do a little bit of construction projects. Uh, all of the high school students had prepared circus acts and circus activities to teach all of the children at Escuela Caracol. And then at the end of the week, all of the children would perform a circus for their parents and the teachers and whatever community members would come to watch it. And so see the, for me, the absolute most incredible part of the trip. And this includes, you know, seeing all of the old buildings in Antigua and uh, hiking up a mountain and watching a World Cup game on a television in San Marcos. All of those things paled in comparison to watching our students teaching your students and then watching what came out of that and all of them doing a circus show for us with stilts and juggling and mm -hmm. a whole lot of uh, balavis activities and watching everybody enjoying it the students as teachers the students as students all the students as performers so um, I fell in love with Guatemala when I got off the plane. I fell in love with Escuela Caracol when I saw the changes your kids had on our kids while they were there. Um, it was 
it was life transforming. And so when Kim uh, D'Angelo arranged another trip down uh, the next year, it was a no brainer. Of course, I was going to chaperone again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course. It's you, like mentioned a cold has... you mentioned, um, you know, about the, the uh, kind of magnetic quality of a Suela Caracol and hearing you talk, Glenn, too, and just seeing the way it touched you. I mean, th there really is nothing like there, there's really something special. about when you open that gate, you walk up this crazy little path and you open the gate into this other world. And then if you're lucky enough to get to spend a day in the school and feel the energy there to feel how happy everyone is to be there. Um, I mean, the last time I was there, you know, still it was just such a blessing for me to see the happiness of the children um, there and, and, and all the teachers and everyone who works there and the camaraderie and the community that lives there. Um, it, it is really, there's someone who used to work with us, uh, Mercedes, who lives in um, Spain. She she used to say, Escuela Caracol es una gema. Um, and it is, it is, it's like a gem that, that lives in the world. And uh, I was fond when we were there of always referring to San Marcos as sort of a vivero de sueños, right? Like a little greenhouse for, for people's dreams. And the things that, that grow there don't necessarily grow huge, but they grow. And people will find the ability to plant dreams there. And Escuela Caracol is one of those dreams, I think, that was planted and was able to flourish in a, in a way that is inspired people around the world yeah when when this all began did you like did you think that it was going to to become what it what it did like this special place that that is making like is being the center of a huge community of people from all over the world did you think something like that was going to happen or i didn't did you? I did. <laughs> <laughs> what was I, the expectation? I never thought about the rest of the world. I, I just thought about San Marcos. Um, so I didn't think that. But I was surprised when people started saying they wanted to come visit from other places. But you did? Yeah, I I always did. I always, I don't know. I, I felt like there was already everything to make a fire. We just had to light the spark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, yeah. I really felt like San Marcos was such a special place in the world. And um, yeah, I, I think I always dreamed that it would be what it is. <laughs> okay, it, is uh, it, it is a completely different Waldorf school from my experiences. Uh, my wife is the admissions director at our school here in North Carolina. And so I, I uh, get to learn about other schools as parents move to North Carolina. And so they look for a Waldorf school for their children because they attended one in California or New York or Mexico or Canada. And uh, those schools are very much with a European centric curriculum. You know, it's still a very German school everywhere else that I see. And Escuela Caracol is a Waldorf school in and of Guatemala and in and of San Marcos. And you really do feel like the Waldorf uh, philosophy is not culturally dependent it is caringly dependent the teachers love the children and the children love learning and that doesn't require a set uh, a, a set curriculum from germany or from the united states it requires a caring heart in the minds of the teachers and so <clears throat> I really enjoyed how different it was and still the things that I expect at my school here, I see there, you are outdoors. You learn by playing and you play by learning. And these go hand in hand because if you try to separate them, 
you make learning unfun. Mm -hmm. So when when Escuela Caracol began, it was just a kindergarten, right? Um, That's correct. So what was the idea? First, you you started working or gathering with people from town. Well, can you tell us what? How how did that happen? How did that group of people interested on in the well-being of uh, of the children became a school? For the community um we wanted to have a play group a, a small play group with our our daughter was four at the time and uh we didn't we really didn't want it to just be a bunch of international families coming together we from the very beginning we wanted to have In intercultural exchange. Uh, so it did start with, at first it did start as the very, very beginning was a tiny play group with international families and we would go from house to house. And then um, I decided it, it got a little hard for everyone to coordinate all that. And I was like, okay, I can just help do this. We can host it. Um, and then very soon after that, we invited in local children And um, since the school year there ends in October, we decided to do a summer school. And that was, summer was starting in November then. So that was 2007. We had 12 children. We had six local children and six international children. And we ran a, was it like a five week, yeah. six week program? Five week summer session. Mm -hmm. And and Nicholas Nicholas, who was also helping to found the school with us, um, he was working around the clock late at night to get the first palapa up, that one that's outside of the kitchen that has the catacol in it, and we bought some tiles and asked if he would help to make a mosaic, and he said. Yeah, I have this great tool. I can cut the tiles in these beautiful shapes for you. And we were like, well, we just want you to break them. <laughs> <laughs> He was like, what? Uh, but then when we kind of talked about the idea, he got very excited about it. And so he made the caracol. And I still remember him do also, that was his idea. The, the design at the doorway of that little building that has, I think it's like a sun and a moon. Uh, mm -hmm. He was the one who came up with that idea. He's like, well, I could just do this right here. And I can still remember seeing him working late at night. He hooked up these big lights to get it all done right in time for us to start that first group of kids. So that's how we got mm -hmm. started. Yeah. Nicolas was the, was Joshua's right hand in, in the school, right? He was like the person in charge of building and taking care of the, of the plants. And... For those who have been in Escuela Caracol, he was the one who built the spiral, the, the stone spiral, right by the um, Palapa. So he, he was like a, a very, very special and important person for our school and for our community. So Glenn, can you tell us a little bit about your expectations before going to, to Escuela Caracol, because I know that for most of the people that, that never have been to Central America or to Guatemala, like the expectations are, are wild, are like, I don't know, like uh, that we don't have cities or that we don't have roads. I don't know, something like that. That's what I've heard. But can you tell us your experience? So it was five years ago, uh, next month, actually. Uh, and In leading up to it, I would say my assumption was that Guatemala was villages in the jungle. And then I learned that there were volcanoes there, so it would be villages in the jungle with volcanoes rising up out of them. And we did get to experience that a little bit, um, but because I was part of the chaperone group, we had to plan things. And so, uh, you know, learning how we would get to San Marcos from Guatemala City 
was eye-opening. One, learning how huge Guatemala City is. Uh, and, and that started to trickle in learning that really American cities are tiny. Uh, except for New York City, Chicago, and LA, our cities are small compared to everywhere else in the world. And Guatemala City is, not, is, is no exception. It is huge. And then, um, you know, we expected either things were just going to go completely smoothly. You know, we would get there, we'd take, because they talked about taking a limo to San Marcos. And so we had the idea of a limo, meaning a limousine, you know, fancy red carpet kind of stuff. And they were these 10 passenger vans that they put 15 of us in. Mm. And we're on roads that they, are narrow and so I have never been on a spot where you had to stop to let someone else pass you. And so those, you know, just the cultural shock experiences of my privilege in the United States of assuming, well, this is, if you have roads and cars, of course the roads are just like ours and everything operates the same way. And so uh, the expectations of everything being the same and at the same time, a contradiction of expecting to be going into nothing but you know primitive space primitive culture primitive land mm -hmm. yeah. and i am i was so blessed to have all of my negative expectations shattered they just they were wrong and all of my positive expectations were blown out of the water they were they my expectations weren't high enough for what I ended up experiencing. And you know, I said, it was transformative. Even the, th the weird things, the day after we got there was when the huge earthquake hit Guatemala. And um, I, so I am an early riser and the time change, uh, Guatemala is two hours behind, or yeah, two hours behind where I am and I get up between five and six every morning without an alarm clock. So I'm there and my five or six o'clock arrives at three in the morning. I managed to stay in bed and force myself to stay in bed until five o'clock local time. And then I get up to take a shower and at 516, the earthquake hit. <laughs> and so- I remember that day. We all got to experience that me being awake all of the kids were definitely asleep for another two hours uh, yeah. and then we made our way up to the school and you know there was no power but things moved forward whereas uh here in the united states if, if that happened nothing would happen everything would be shut down until it was fixed and in guatemala we had inconveniences but we moved through the day mm -hmm. and so, so that resilience was cool <laughs> I think you just mentioned one of the most important or the yeah one of the most important features of Escuela Caracol is that it doesn't centers only on the academical issues or on that part of the of the development of the children. It, it focuses in um, in, in te integral. In, on the integ integral development of, of our students. Can you please tell us something about it, Corina or, or Josh, about what was the, how did you, how did you end up managing this school that was nurturing heads, hearts and hands of children instead of only a, a place to, to learn, to gain knowledge? How, how did we, uh, can you repeat the question? How did we make a school? Okay. Academic? <clears throat> yeah. Instead of being only a school, like a regular school. Well, I think, I mean, part of that was meeting the community there. The, the community of San Marcos is, is not an academic community. And, and, and we felt that there was something extremely valuable in that 
that the rest of the world has lost touch with. The rest of the world, um, you know, the, the, the industrialized modern world tends to be more intellectual, more academic. And I mean, one of the, the beautiful things that I remember noticing in the early years for the first time was that we would have certain students who come from international families who had maybe really traveled all around the world and might speak four languages. And then you'd have another kid there from San Marcos who had never left his village in his whole life, but he could start a fire in the rain. And um, that quality I feel like is so, so so needed right now in our world. So I think part of it for me, and I don't know for you, but it was about celebrating what San Marcos was um, and meeting it and, and, and really trying to, and also I would say, and, and, and maybe a, perhaps a little bit of a selfish way, trying to learn from, from the kids and the families there in San Marcos and creating a school where, where the students who came felt like, not that they were coming to school because they didn't know anything, and they had to learn something, but to, have, to wake up to what they already had um, and to celebrate and to be able to teach other people what they already had. Um, I think a lot of that was a part of it for me. I don't know. About Definitely. You. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it was about, about meeting San Marcos, what, what that village is, the people there, the people in the region of Lake Atitlan. Um, and and really trying to and, and we felt like there was a, such a natural connection with why the Waldorf School was created, which was so much about trying to strengthen something that was being increasingly lost in modern civilization, modern societies, um, which lived and still lives, I think, in San Marcos and in, in the region um, of Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have well, you you didn't have uh, backgrounds in world education right before before you came to San Marcos how how did that happen why did you choose or why did you why did you do that or or how was it like your first connection with welder pedagogy uh, well, we didn't have a background in Waldorf education, but we did have a background in um sociology and religious studies so we were really interested in, in, in on the one hand we were really interested in modern society and we both felt this really deep sense of something really lacking in our modern world and and some some really dehumanizing forces we we had our child at the time and we didn't want to put our child in a stroller. We didn't want to buy an SUV. We didn't want to like have cabinets full of plastic sippy cups. <laughs> we didn't want our child to grow up in a world where children are viewed as something something that you buy things for. And then you and then they grow up and in, in turn just learn to keep buying and consuming. We wanted our child to learn to grow up to be a producer in this world and to learn to work with her hands and do these things. So um, we had that impulse in us, which is something that really lives in Waldorf education. Uh, when we met, we got married when we were in college and our next door neighbors, when we found our first little apartment, had they sent their daughter to the Kimberton Waldorf School, which is one of the first Waldorf schools in the United States. And, and we just so resonated with her and how she was being brought up that we Waldorf put a name to something that we were really living with deeply. I think. Yeah. So, so yeah, when we started this school, we, that's when we really just started to like dig into uh, our, we started to further our research. We, we, we learned from other Waldorf schools and we also, Josh in particular, read a lot of Steiner, Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we got to Waldorf. Yeah, so definitely it had a lot a lot of things to do with your backgrounds, right? Like this special sensitivity that you already had was was like special for 
for his for the school very special okay so i think we're gonna end up this conversation now it was amazing having you today with us celebrating the 13th anniversary of our school felices 13 años a los papás de la escuela because you are the school's parents so <laughs> happy 13 years as as the school of caracol's parents and thank you on behalf of everyone here in Kamala, everyone on behalf of pardon i'm sorry my dogs are like <laughs> on behalf of, of everyone from our community i want to thank you for having done what you did and for having planted the seeds and for for you <laughs> just just like that okay so thank you very much again thanks for having accepted the invitation to be here with us thank you glenn and thank you. we hope to we hope to have we hope to have you back in guatemala soon maybe next year with kim's group <laughs> yeah we wanted to be there this summer we were planning to be there this well yeah i know you're gonna be back here soon so no. <laughs> yeah. okay so uh, good night both of you thank you muchos abrazos a los niños un abrazo muy especial al Cia. one of my best stories like one of my magical stories has a lot of a lot to do with althea thanks to her i met one of the world's greatest oh, magicians yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. do you remember oh, that I'll, i i will never forget that never <laughs> okay so but that's a story for another day another time Dicen adiós. Saludos adiós. a todos. Adiós. adiós. Abrazos grandes. Bueno, feliz noche. Les extrañamos mucho. Muchísimo. Y muchísimas gracias a todas las personas que estuvieron viendo esta transmisión. Thanks to everyone who, who stood up or who just stayed in front of the phone or the computer watching this transmission. Greetings from everyone in Escuela Caracol. Adiós. Chao. Feliz noche. No, gracias, Wendy. Gracias. Thanks, Glenn. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you.